This is Dimitri Lascaris for the Real News Network. On October 30th, the World Meteorological Association issued a greenhouse gas bulletin reporting that concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere surged at record-breaking speed in 2016 to 403.3 parts per million. According to the bulletin, the rate of increase of atmospheric carbon dioxide over the past 70 years is nearly 100 times larger than that at the end of the last ice age. Such abrupt changes in the atmospheric levels of CO2 have never seen, been seen before. Rapidly increasing atmospheric levels of CO2 and other greenhouse gases have the potential to initiate unprecedented changes in climate systems, leading to, quote, severe ecological and economic disruptions, said the report. Scientists say that recent devastating hurricanes in the U.S. and the Caribbean are examples of major disasters that may have been made much more destructive by human-caused climate change. With us to discuss the World Meteorological Association's report and what these record levels of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere mean, we are joined by Dr. Kevin Trenberth. Dr. Trenberth is a distinguished science, senior scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory. He joins us today from Boulder, Colorado. Thank you for joining us again today, Kevin. Good to be here, thank you. In, in, in the new report, uh, Kevin, it says that globally average concentrations of CO2 reached 403.3 parts per million in 2016, up from 400 parts per million in 2015 because of a combination of human activities and a strong El Nino event. Uh, concentrations of CO2 are now 145% above pre-industrial levels, according to the Greenhouse Gas Bulletin. What did the Earth and its climate look like the last time that CO2 levels were this high? Oh, so that's going back um, probably something like three, three million years or, or more. It's a very long time ago. So uh, the pre-industrial value was around 280 parts per million by volume, and that was fairly stable from about 9,000 years ago up until um, you know, 200 years ago. And, uh, and about 45% of the increase has occurred uh, well, 45% of, uh, of the increase has occurred since that time, but half of that increase has occurred since about 1980. We can go back reasonably well to about um, 900,000 years ago using ice cores in Antarctica and Greenland with bubbles of air trapped in the ice. But going back further, is much more difficult and the information is much more fuzzy and, and hazy. But the estimate is that you have to go back, you know, three million years or something like that when, you know, the even the continental drift comes into play and other factors have led to changes. But certainly the, 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 uh, the atmospheric concentrations prior to then was quite different. And it was much higher uh, if you go back, what, 50, a million years ago, back to times when the dinosaurs were running around and things like that. So it was a much warmer period at that time. So, so at the, you, you indicated that we can go back 100, 800,000 years or so and try to reconstruct what the world looked like. What was, what was the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere at that time? Do we have that figure? Uh, 800,000, the last 800,000 years. Well, the, there's a series of of so-called glacials and interglacials, as uh, you know, we call the glacials ice ages, and uh, the last major ice age was about uh, 20,000 years ago, something like that. And you know, at that time, there was a major ice uh, sheet over North America and also over Europe, uh, and values are uh, about 100 parts per million by volume lower during the ice age uh, during the ice ages. And then as we came out of the ice age, there was uh, uh, an increase that occurred in a number of surges and got us to the level uh, that we've been rel relatively stable at in the last uh, 9,000 years. So, well, what I'm trying to get at is, uh, in particular, uh, at a point in time where we had comparable levels of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere as we have today, what did the ice sheets look like, and what did sea level uh, sea levels look like? So, so the last major interglacial uh, was uh, what 100 and, uh, 120, years ago, or something like that. And uh, and you know, temperatures were uh, maybe a bit warmer than they are 
now, uh, but the uh, Greenland ice sheet was much lower uh, and sea levels were um, estimated maybe four meters higher or something like that. And so conditions were uh, very different than today. But, you know, these evolved over, over thousands of years in, in order to get to that point. And the key point of this report really is that the changes we're making today are occurring in 100 years, whereas in nature they occur in, uh, you know, 10,000 years. Right. Now, emissions of CO2 from human activity, there's some indication that they've uh, plateaued uh, in the very uh, recent past. And yet in 2016, we saw this surprisingly large increase in the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, if, in fact, CO2 emissions are plateauing, how could we have seen such an unusually large increase in CO2 concentrations? What would account for that? Well, you're talking about emissions versus concentrations. Emissions are what we're putting into the atmosphere and the rate at which we're doing that. And then the concentrations are the uh, cumulative result. And so as long as you're putting anything into the atmosphere, the concentrations will continue to go up. And so although we have stabilized emissions in the last uh, few years, in particular in the U.S., the emissions have stabilized. They've even gone down a little bit. Uh, but the concentrations uh, continue to rise. And uh, the fact that it's risen at the record rate in the last year well, part of that might be related to the El Nino and the conditions that have arisen, but it's an indication that we're really not getting this problem under control at all. Might it be an indication that we've, we've actually achieved a tipping point or on the verge of doing so? Well, a tipping point relates to irreversible changes, and indeed, some of these changes may ultimately uh, be that way. You know, the warming of the ocean that's going on uh, we're at a point where the ocean heat content uh, this year is, is the highest on record. It's probably contributed to all of the hurricane activity and so on that we've seen. And, uh, and it's very hard to cool off the oceans. Um, it's very hard to put back major ice sheets. So if Greenland were to melt, and it's in the process of, of certainly melting, it's very hard to put that back. And, and so there are changes in the ocean which are going on that we worry about. You know, they may not really be reversible. And at some point, it may become obvious that that's the case. It's less obvious at the moment. And, and does this finding perhaps suggest that uh, we have, the scientific community has underestimated the rapidity with which we have to move to a zero carbon world? I don't think the scientific community has underestimated that, but I think uh, the politicians have, and econ economists have greatly underestimated that. And so this is reflected in uh, the national plans like the Clean Power Plan or also in the Paris Agreement. You know, the Paris Agreement uh, was a major achievement and uh, international uh, approach to reducing the emissions and, and, uh, and trying to slow down and prevent the problem from happening. Uh, but if you look at it really hard, it's, it'll make a dent, but it really won't solve the problem. It doesn't go far enough. None of these uh, changes that have been put in place, uh, including the U.S. national changes, are, are going anything like far enough because we really have to move to a carbon-free economy um, really quite quickly, a time scale of, say, 20 years, which, which might be doable. Uh, you know, it's not something we can turn a switch on. And, and, and lastly, the, the magnitude of the increase we saw in CO2 concentration in 2015, does that suggest that or add uh, to force to the argument that staying within the aspirational goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, stated in the Paris Climate Accord that you referred to uh, is, is unrealistic at this stage? Do we I think have it's less to, feel, to, I, I to feel optimistic about that? I, I don't think there's any chance we'll stay within 1.5 degrees. And, and, and in some ways, they are talking about not really staying within 1.5 degrees, but maybe going up to 3 degrees Celsius and then coming back down to 1.5 degrees. But, you know, if you go up to 3 degrees Celsius warming globally, there will be major changes, including major melting of Greenland and various other changes that... Um, you know, these things are not linear. They're not reversible. 
in, in reality. So I think that's quite unrealistic. You know, we're going to blow through 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius very easily, I think, and it'll be a major challenge to stay within two degrees Celsius warming overall. And, uh, you know, what we're seeing in this report uh, is an indication that uh, uh, all of the changes that have been made uh, in terms of moving more to solar power and non-renewable sources, it, it's still uh, only a small dent so far, and it's not going anywhere near far enough quickly enough. This has been Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News speaking to Dr. Kevin Trenberth about a new report showing a, a record concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere at 403.3 parts per million. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Trenberth. You're most welcome. And this is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News.